Jennifer. Thanks, everybody. It's been great to work on this panel with, uh, with so many experts um, sharing some examples of sort of different perspectives of, of um, opening more data in terms of uh, policy and trying to come up with some sort of practical tips. Let's see if this is the way. Yeah, excellent. Um, so just for folks who aren't that familiar with Dryad, I'll just briefly go over. Dryad is a digital repository, and uh, we focus on data that links to scholarly articles. Um, this is a screenshot of the home page and uh, the location where you can submit articles. You can also browse for data here. We have almost 16,000 data packages in our system made up of many files that represent over 56,000 authors and over 500 journals. We have partnered with 107 journals. A few unique features of Dryad is that every data package that we have in the repository is linked out to a scholarly article, a chapter of a book, um, some thesis. It's un undergone some kind of review, some kind of peer review or, or review. Another is that all data has been curated by a uh, trained professional curator. We do a light touch curation, which I'll talk about a little bit further. And in addition, we integrate our data submission system with the various manuscript systems to enable easy data publication as a way to support journal policies. We've done this with some of the major systems like Editorial Manager, Scholar One, Bench Press, eJournal Press, even proprietary systems. And another unique uh, thing about Dryad is that we are a nonprofit and we're governed by a board of directors and organizational members who are encouraged to join Dryad and have a say in the future of the organization to vote on board appointments, bylaws, changes, and so forth. Here is, here. here is actually a logo wall of the Dryad organizational members that guide the strategy and governance of Dryad. Dryad itself was formed by a group of journal editors and remaining community-led by a diverse group of stakeholders in open data remains a goal of the organization as well as, I believe, a strength. So we saw this slide earlier, so I won't um, stay on it for too long, um, but the motive, it speaks also to the motivation, in my view, of open data. Um, the motivation of open data is kind of similar, really, to that of open access publishing, really, but it, it does have some serious distinctions. The general motivation for open data is not because when a particular researcher wants to examine data that supports an article, they're blocked by a paywall. It's actually more serious than that. Uh, without reliable infrastructure for data, the scholarship with uh, which an article is uh, supported is just not there and can disappear. Uh, so it's much scarier. And that the idea that the actual information gleaned from the study is just lost. So open data itself isn't really a movement just to free data from paywalls, though that sort of does come into it. Um, it's more of, a of um, safeguarding data. So looking at this slide, you can see, as we mentioned before, that as research articles age, the possibility of finding that data also ages. 17% of the knowledge every year falls. Uh, in fact, the likelihood of finding an author's email itself drops by 7% every year. And that, to me, I think speaks to the idea of asking an author um, for uh, providing data after, that sometimes that's not as easy as, as we like. Um, so I think really because the odds of finding data or even contacting info for, for authors drop every year, the best time to provide data for preservation that links to an article is at the time of manuscript submission or before, not after. So a little bit interesting about the origin of Dryad is an example, I think, of policy. Um, Dryad's unique story begins with the Joint Data Archive Policy, or JDAP. And this policy stated that data should be deposited in an appropriate public archive as a condition of publication. It should be linked back to the article. And data should be preserved to support future reuse. And this policy was designed and adopted by a dozen or so journal editors uh, in the life sciences in 2011. And they came together and agreed on the basics of policy. This is an early example of collaboration to standardize and guide a community on the topic of research data and to influence those that may, may border of that community. And the bringing together of a group of editors from sometimes competing journals to standardize policy really in 2011 was really innovative. Of course, it, it could be even, it's a little innovative even for today's measures. And of course, a coffee shop was involved because science. 
The result was, cure, was clear and simple data policy that didn't penalize anyone, didn't create unnecessary hurdles, but had a minimum amount of requirements, was high enough level that it was easy to communicate and um, was communicated effectively. So looking at how, in fact, how uh, impactful policy can be, uh, this is taken from a study of phylogenetic data to see how data availability was indeed impacted by this JDAP policy and to compare it to the National Science Foundation's policy requiring data management plans, which came out, uh, were, they were introduced to about the same time. The vertical axis shows the proportion of data that was available from articles published between the years of 2002 and 2014, which is shown along the horizontal. And so the first block on the, on the left illustrates that when papers were funded by National Science Foundation, but were not published in journals with JDAP, there was a minor increase in availability after 2011. Contrast this with the middle block. When papers were published in a journal that put this policy into place, even if they were not funded by NSF, the post-JDAP increase was really impressive. Data availability increases from less than 10% to over 80% in a few short years. So what made the difference here was good, clear policy and infrastructure to support it. In these cases, the infrastructure was mainly Dryad and also other specialized repositories. And for other communities, preferred infrastructure certainly can be different. So how does it work? How do we sort of support, uh, uh, support this kind of data? Um, well, Dryad, as I mentioned, has integrated with 107 journals, and this is one workflow, the early one that we had, which was to take data after an article has been accepted and was on its way to being published. Now we actually have two more workflows that allow you to have data during review and even earlier, but the options are still easy. And with the submission integration, essentially there's a metadata exchange between the repository and journal, which has a variety of technical options. You can do this by email or API, but either case, it ensures bi-directional linking of the article and data, and the end result is its article with its DOI linked to a data set with its DOI. And the benefits are this automatic um, sharing of detailed metadata that's all provided accurately, automatically. Links are created and resolved according to each journal's policies, so support things like embargo options. Data can be used during review process, and integration is an open process to uh, set up in any particular journal. So part of the Dryad workflow is curation, which is a service to partners and authors. Publishers often focus on adding quality to the research output in terms of services like peer review and article dissemination, and data curation can provide a similar level of quality on the data side. For example, at Dryad, our curators make sure data is academic, that files are virus-free, can be easily viewed, that there's no intellectual property issues, and also more and more, we're looking to evaluate that there are no identifiable human subjects data, sensitive data, or rare species location data. Curators have an essential and helpful role in this infrastructure that provides a quicker customer service and advice about file formats and documentation, and this can be part of a policy in terms of making data available. So um, this is a slide that Ian referred to earlier, um, it, and I like to look at this in terms of impactful data policies. So when you're creating a data policy or improving on a data policy, um, one thing to consider is what are the goals of that policy? Is it to get uh, a journal or a society or group just started, or is it to move the needle to make things more open? Um, one aspect of this meaningful data policy, in my view, is a data availability statement at the time of submission, which will ask where the data are. So this figure comes from a 2011 study, which um, Ian mentioned earlier, of 12 journals, where the author wanted to discover what fraction of articles have data available and how specifics in this journal policy affect that. And note that each numbered bar is actually representing a, an individual journal. Uh, so the first observation is illustrated in the first grouping of one through four and five through eight. Um, you'll see that outcomes between journals that do not have an archiving policy at all and journals that recommend archi archiving will hardly differ. So this was alluded to before. So recommending archiving won't necessarily result in a lot of data that comes out, but maybe your goal is different. Maybe your goal is to get started on the conversation. 
Um, also interesting to see in the second group between 9 and 10 there and 11 and 12 on the right, these compare four journals which all mandate archiving. Uh, but note that the journals that include a data availability statement, which is under 11 and 12, have a much better uptake than those that do not. So again, if you're mandating archiving and you want to actually see data, then you need to put that, um, some of that uh, workflow into place. So Dryad's business model is a little different from other repositories. As an open data repository, we have been actually charging four years of data publication charges, or DPCs, and we've learned a lot. The advantage of the DPC is that it allows for fast growth, it's more it scales, it's flexible, it's very transparent. Um, we encourage the DPC as a service linked to publication of the data and curation, and there's no charge ever to access or download data from Dryad. Um, we encourage publishers, journals, societies, funders to sponsor this DPC on the, the behalf of their authors as part of their data policy. It can be quite reasonable for a journal or publisher to cost out data support in this way, actually. There are many plans available to suit the particular policies or the goals or the usage that you have, but unfortunately many publishers and um, funders still do not sponsor the DPC as part of their policy and just leave it up to their authors. So recently we did a survey with researchers who pay their own DPC and wanted to know how is this going. So we surveyed 1,300 researchers who pay the DPC charge on their own to get a better understanding of their challenges when they're asking for reimbursement or finding funds or trying to charge assorted grants. And we received a response rate of 25%, which shows that this topic has a, real lot, a lot of teeth. This slide is from the survey and shows that researchers who submitted a data management plan as part of their grant project, and what we found was that almost half of them had committed to archiving data as part of that plan. You can see this in the first bar on the blue. That's the, those are the folks who said yes. Um, but almost none of them actually budgeted for archiving data, which is in the second group. And quite a few, actually 41%, which is shown on the last bar section, archive the data after the grant period ended. Further, over 40% said that when choosing which journal to submit to, sponsorship of the Dryad DPC does or may influence their decision. So what's interesting is to see, in my view, is um, the uh, researchers depositing data after their grant is ended because the publication of the paper and the data costs happen sometimes well after that period's ending. And the assumption for institutions, publishers, societies, or the researcher themselves that the grant's actually going to cover that data and sometimes the timing doesn't work out. The good news is that content that we see in repositories in general is increasing and broadening which shows us that the understanding of what can and should be curated, linked to a publication, or preserved for future uh, generations, is also increasing. We see in Dryad a larger variety of data being published. For instance, um, the most popular data sets in Dryad in terms of downloads from 2016, among the top five includes data on plant genetics, the early history of ray finned fishes, and not surprisingly in this age, the effects of climate change on forests, but also of major interest was a data set of social media data from Sci-Hub and data from one of the top five journals of cardiology. So in spite of the current threat to the continued accessibility of research data, more open data is available than ever before. When looking at a data policy and implementing support for your research data, long-term sustainability is an important consideration repositories provide a safe space for safe place for data and I'm excited to as another example to announce a new partnership between Dryad and Dan's Dan's or the data archiving and network services promote sustained access to digital research data it's an institute of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences and will now be a long-term successor data archive for all published uh, data in Dryad through this partnership, Dryad authors, users, partners, and people who are downloading data for their studies can be assured that long-term global access to their scholarly outputs will be maintained, while Dan's will further enhance its data holdings and support its mission to promote sustained stewardship of digital research data. So this is another great example of why partnering with a repository is good for your data and good for your authors. Thank you. <laughs>